In the name of God, amen. Please be seated. For those of us who work to make Christmas happen as much in church as in your own homes, uh, there's always the distinction between what we do to make Christmas happen and when Christmas happens. I don't know how else to explain it except for that feeling that washes over you that reminds you why we do what we do and why we're here. One year it happened to a friend of mine who was in a bit of a funk at Christmas, which is bad in my profession. And um, he was out of sorts trying to get in the spirit of things and nothing was working. And on the day before Christmas, as he was struggling at home with his sermon, one of the neighbor boys from an immigrant family came knocking at the door, full of energy and obviously wanting to practice his new English skills. So he knocks on the door and he says, trick or treat. <laughs> and that did it for my friend. It happened for me last Saturday in a bit more somber way, I must say. Uh, 200 of us or so were gathered here in the cathedral, while a somewhat smaller group assembled at the Christian Lutheran Church in Bethlehem, Palestine. Aided by technology that enabled us to see and hear one another, together we celebrated the birth of Christ. And throughout the United States and Europe, thousands joined us via the internet. And the senior pastor from the church in Bethlehem, a man by the name of Mitri Reheb, welcomed us with the ancient biblical greeting, Salam. And then he said, the words of the Christmas carol, a little town of Bethlehem, are as true today like in old times. In the dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. For in this Christmas season, he said, while the Palestinian community was celebrating the lighting of the Christmas tree on Manger Square, young Palestinians who were demonstrating their longing for freedom were shot at by the reinvading soldiers of the Israeli occupation. And so two contradictory phenomena so poignantly met in Bethlehem as we continue to live, he said, between tear gas and Christmas ornaments, between shattered hope and resilient faith. Still, he said, living with both hopes and fears, we reaffirm our faith in the child of Bethlehem who came, that we might have life and have it abundantly. Now, the service lasted less than an hour and the connection between us felt tenuous most of the time. There was a time lag and an echo as we took turns reciting the sacred text, just like the ones we've read tonight and offering our prayers. We couldn't see each other very well, and occasionally there was that awful screeching sound of audio feedback. At one point, we lost contact completely. And when it was restored, we weren't sure whose turn it was to speak. But it was in that connection between us, as we in the cathedral also felt the juxtaposition of tear gas and Christmas ornaments, that Christmas came and it hurt but we were glad, all of us here, we were glad for it. Glad for the pain almost because there was something in the connection that was so true to the meaning of this night. It felt as if in that connection, the integrity of our Christian witness 
was at stake. Where else would a Christian go but to where the light and the love of Christ are sorely needed? So as we gather here again on this holy night, I think again of all the connections, yours and mine, the strong ones, the tenuous ones, with the time lags and the echoes, the poor sight lines and the audio feedback, connections to places in your world and mine where the light and the love of Christ are most needed. That's where Christians go. Surely there is such a place inside you, perhaps known to you alone. We all look um, pretty good, actually, when we get dressed up for Christmas Eve. But inside, we all have those places. I know that I do. Where we're less than whole, less than what we want others to see when we're in their presence, where we're wounded, where parts of us that we're not proud of reside, the things we would give anything to change. And God gladly takes residence there in that place with loving kindness. Brene Brown writes that love is the last thing we need to ration in this world, and it's the last thing we need to ration tonight. The truth is that when we practice empathy and compassion for anyone, including ourselves, connecting to that place, we increase the amount of love in the world so we can allow the light and the love of God to reach us there where we need it most. And then there will be more of that love and that light to share. Consider now your connection and mine, however strong and tenuous, static filled or joyful to places of great need in your family in your circle of friends or close colleagues. And in the beauty of this sanctuary, hold the lifeline to that place as best you can, knowing that your task is never to fix or improve, but to love. None of us lives inside a Rockwell painting or in a Friends episode, but with real people. And the connections between real people are always less than perfect, and there are always places of disappointment and vulnerability. And we can allow the connection to Christ to meet us there, to meet us there. And from yourself now and myself and from your circle of immediate concern and mine, think of the ways we are connected, that we're all connected, however tenuously, to the peoples of our community and this country and the world. Some of those connections are readily apparent, given who we are and the particularities of our lives. Others require active engagement, a choice to connect, a willingness to reach out for another's sake. And some connections are thrust upon us. On the night when we remember a child born I can't stop thinking of the child who died. You may remember him, his photograph in September, washed ashore, 
and how the world responded, how we all responded in that moment with such compassion and resolve to help, to do what we could to help those fleeing a war-ravaged land. You see, how we celebrate Christmas and how we live our lives depends in large measure on how and to whom we are connected. And those connections are our gift, our gift. And as Christians, our greatest responsibility. We are not the light. We testify to the light. And we can only testify from the places where we stand. The bishop from Jerusalem preached on Saturday and he proclaimed that God's answer to a broken world was to send the light of Christ. Therefore, he said, we will not teach darkness. We will not teach revenge or despair. We will not resort to extremism. We will not teach xenophobia toward other religions and people. We are witnesses to the light from Bethlehem. Well, friends, we are witnesses to the light from Washington, D.C. and throughout our land. In our hope and fear, we too affirm our faith in a child who came, that we might have life and have it in abundance, and not just us, but all children of God. Therefore, we will not make peace with racial injustice. We will not make peace with growing social inequality, but strive each day for a better day for all God's children. We will not accept as the inevitable human cost of our prosperity a rising homeless population, stagnant wages for the working poor, and the ecological deterioration of the planet. And we will not allow our public discourse to be dominated by those who barter in fear. But we will testify to the light and welcome those who come to this land seeking refuge from war. Our connections are our greatest gift. And we must go as those who testify to the light of Christ where that light is needed most. For what else would a Christian do? Where else can a Christian go? Salam. Amen.